स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello friends you are welcome in the 11th session of the course of administrative law in the earlier session that is the 10th session we have discussed the principles of natural justice wherein i also gave the summary to the two basic principles of natural justice the rule against bias and the rule of audi ultram partum that is the rule of hearing let me elaborate these two basic rules of natural justice because being the essence of administrative law being the essence of the principles of natural justice these cannot be understood only by explaining in summary and therefore we will discuss in the this 11th session the rule against bias and in the next session the 12th session 12th lecture the audi ultram partum or the rule of hearing the rule against bias it is represented by a maxim nemo judex in causa sua this maxim nemo judex in causa sua signifies rule against bias rule against bias is the first principle of natural justice this rule refers to the independence impartiality and neutrality adjudicator in examining adjudicating and deciding any case it is the rule of disqualification because this rule against bias disqualifies such persons from being the decision makers from being the judges from being the adjudicators in such a case where he has been or he has any interest in the subject matter of the case or in any party to the case such a person cannot take an objective decision because as i earlier told you that this rule refers to the independence impartiality and neutrality of an adjudicator the independence of an adjudicator is required in the area of administrative adjudication because of the fact that it is human psychology that if the person making adjudication of any case any person who is deciding any case if he is not independent of the parties he is not independent of the subject matter of the case he cannot take an objective decision and objectivity is the basis of any kind of adjudication either it is the adjudication of in the area of administration or it is the adjudication by the formal courts so the independence of the adjudicator the independence of the judge the independence of the decision maker it is the condition precedent for any kind of impartial adjudication or decision making process so independence and impartiality these two are connected together very closely and therefore any person who is given the responsibility to adjudicate any particular case or to make the decision in a case he should be independent of the parties he should be impartial and he should also be neutral and all these three elements the independence the impartiality and neutrality of a person making adjudication are very closely connected to each other and these are the supplementary to each other why we need the impartiality why we need the independence why we need the neutrality of a person in the area of administrative adjudication because it is the human psychology that a person cannot take an objective decision in a case wherein he has his own interest anybody no person can decide against his own interest and therefore such a person who is not impartial 
such a person who is not independent, such a person who is not neutral, he cannot take objective decisions. The rule against bias, it is grounded on two principles. Number one, because of this psychology that a person who is not independent, who is not impartial, who is not neutral, he cannot take an objective decision. Because of this fact, there is a principle in the area of administrative adjudication, in the area of formal adjudication also that an individual cannot be the judge for his own cause, an individual cannot be the judge in his own case. And number two, that the justice should not only be done, but it should also manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. So, these are the two principles on which the rule against bias is grounded. Number one, that an individual cannot be the judge in his own case or in his own case. And number two, that justice should not only be done, but it should also be seem to be done. This rule of disqualification, the rule against bias is applied with two objectives. It has two objectives to achieve in the process of administrative adjudication. Number two, this rule is applied to, number one, this rule is applied to avoid any kind of possibility of partiality, any kind of possibility of favor or any kind of possibility of bias in the administrative adjudication. Second one is, with the second one objective of the application of rule against bias is to ensure and maintain the public confidence in administrative adjudicatory process. These two objectives are very important or significant objectives to maintain the confidence in the public with relation to the administrative adjudication and therefore, this rule against bias is applied with these two objectives. Therefore, the rule against bias requires that the adjudicatory authority must consist of independent, impartial and neutral persons. When the adjudicatory authority or the adjudicatory body is composed of an independent, impartial and neutral person or with the independent, impartial and neutral persons, only then the objectives of the rule against bias can be achieved and therefore, the rule against bias requires that the adjudicatory authority must consist of independent, impartial and neutral persons. Number two, it requires that these persons must act fairly without any kind of prejudice, without any kind of bias because it is not sufficient for the objective of the rule against bias that the adjudicatory body is composed of or the adjudicatory body consists of independent, impartial and neutral persons. In addition to, do, to this, it is also required that such an administrative adjudicatory authority, such an administrative adjudicatory body which is composed of with the independent, impartial and neutral persons should also act fairly, should also act without any kind of bias, without any kind of prejudice. Thus, the whole foundation of the grand edifice, the foundation of the grand building of rule against bias is built by three components. Number one, impartiality. Number two, objectivity. And number three, the public confidence. These are three important elements. These are three impo important pillars of the basic foundation of the grand building of grand edifice of rule against bias and therefore, this rule against bias is built on these three pillars of its foundation that is the impartiality, the objectivity and public confidence. Impartiality refers to the neutrality of the person making their adjudication and the objectivity refers to the position or the situation in which the decision maker takes the decision, the decision maker reaches to a particular conclusion 
only on the basis of the examination of the materials and the evidences produced by both the parties before this authority. And therefore, the objectivity and impartiality and also the neutrality of this administrative adjud adjudicatory process is the basis of the principles of mutual justice is the basis of rule against bias. For understanding the rule against bias and its application in administrative matters or in the area of administrative functioning, it is also important for us to know to understand the meaning of bias. How does this bias arise? Friends, the bias refers to the malice, the spite, the ill will, the prejudice, the partiality, the favoritism and unfairness, etc. Any kind of such elements which violates equality, which give rise the arbitrariness, these are against the rule against bias. So, rule against bias refers to all these kinds of things like malice, spite, ill will, prejudice, partiality, favoritism and unfairness. Malice means the intent to cause harm, pain, injury or distress to any person. So, there should not be the element of malice in the mind of the adjudicator when he is deciding any case. Spite means to annoy, to upset or to hurt any person. If any administrative adjudicatory authority or the person involving in administrative adjudicatory authority or body, he has the feeling, he has the intent to annoy anybody, to upset anybody or to hurt anybody. He cannot take impartial decision. He cannot take the decision with objectivity. He cannot take the fair decisions. Ill will. Ill will means having any unfriendly or hostile feeling towards someone. So, it is also the element which can negate the objective of rule against bias. Prejudice means any dislike, any hostility or unjust behavior deriving from preconceived opinion. Any such dislike, any such hostility or any unjust behavior which derives from the preconceived notion means the prejudice. Partiality refers to the state of being partial that is the unfair support or favor to anybody or to any person above the other. Favoritism means making the favor or giving unfair advantages to a person of your liking. Unfairness means inequality in treatment. So, if the adjudicator is not treating both the parties of the case equally, it refers to or it means the unfairness. Now, the question arises whether the all kind of these things like malice, spite, ill will, prejudice, partiality, favoritism or unfairness, these are themselves bias or bias is something different or distinct from these. If you see that if anybody or any person or any adjudicatory authority or person involving in any administrative adjudicatory body, he has the malice, he has the spite, he has ill will, he has prejudice or he has the feeling of partiality. Particularly, if we talk about the prejudice, then the question arises whether the prejudice in itself is bias. Suppose any adjudicatory authority or the person making the adjudication or administrative decision making, he has the prejudice in his mind. He has the preconceived notion, preconceived idea, preconceived feeling in his mind. But in the decision making process, he could not find the opportunity to operate that feeling which he had in his mind. And decision is made. Whether this decision is affected by, by bias or whether any bias has been committed by that person in making the decision, this is certainly the question to be understood clearly. So, if 
any such feeling which he had in his mind. He could not operate in the decision making process. He could not operate that feeling in the final decision. Then it would not result into bias. And therefore, the bias is the operative prejudice, the bias is the operative malice, the bias is the operative spite, the bias is the operative ill will, the bias is the operative unfairness by any ad administrative adjudicatory authority to a person. So, when the prejudice, malice, or any such kind of intents or the feelings are operated in the decision making process, only then the bias arises or the bias exists or the bias is committed. This bias tends an adjudicator to decide a case on otherwise considerations or on the considerations other than the evidence, other than the materials which are produced before the authority by both parties to the case. Depending upon the various ways in which the bias may come out, the bias may emanate, the bias may be categorized or the bias may be divided in certain categories like the personal bias. Personal bias arises from any kind of personal relationship of an adjudicator with the parties of the case. So, if the adjudicator has any personal relation with any party to the case or even with the subject matter of the case, then the personal bias arises. Number two, the pecuniary bias. Pecuniary bias arises out of the financial interest of the adjudicator in any party to the case or in the subject matter of the case. If the adjudicator has any financial interest, any economic interest in any party to the case or in the subject matter of the case, then the pecuniary bias arises. The third category of bias is the subject matter bias. This subject matter bias refers to the partiality or connection with the issue, the official bias or the departmental bias, prior utterances or the predetermination of issues or acting under dictation, meaning thereby that the subject matter bias may arise out of the partiality or connection of the adjudicator with the subject matter or with the issue. The subject matter bias may arise out of the official or departmental connection, official or departmental attachment of the decision maker of the adjudicator. The subject matter bias may arise out of the prior statements, the prior utterances or the predetermination of the issues by the adjudicators, by the decision makers. The subject matter bias may also exist if the decision maker or the adjudicatory authority or the adjudicatory body, adjudicator it himself acts under the dictation. So, how these all the three kinds of bias arise and how the courts determine the cases relating to bias, it is also important for us to discuss. In India, there has been two important tests to be applicable in the cases of bias. The courts apply two tests in determining the cases relating to bias. These two tests are number one, the reasonable suspicion of bias test and number two, the real likelihood of bias. What are these two tests? The real likelihood of bias test and re the reasonable suspicion of bias test. Reasonable suspicion of bias test is more broader than the real likelihood of bias test. The reasonable suspicion of bias test imposes the heavier burden of proof over the parties claiming the bias, whereas the real likelihood of bias test is more restrictive test and it imposes lesser burden of proof on the parties or the persons claiming the bias 
on the part of the adjudicator. The real likelihood of bias, when the courts apply the test of real likelihood of bias, the courts relies on the, the inward considerations, the courts relies on their own evaluation or the examination of the appreciation of the evidences or the material produced before the courts. Whereas, when the courts apply the reasonable suspicion of bias test, the courts relies on or insist on the outward considerations. Outward considerations means the opinion of the right minded persons of the society or reasonable persons of the society. In England, now there is no distinction in the test of real likelihood and the test of reasonable suspicion of bias. Because in the case of Metropolitan Properties versus Lennon, which was decided in 1968 by the Court of Appeal in England, it decided or it held that in a given circumstances, whether the real likelihood of bias exists or not, or to ascertain the real likelihood of bias in a given circumstance, the opinion of the right minded persons of the society should be taken into consideration. It means according to the decision of English court, whether there was any real likelihood of bias or not in a given circumstance, that should be ascertained on the basis of, on the ground of, or by considering the opinion of right minded persons of the society. That means, the real likelihood of bias test, which is still applicable in India, has now been boiled down to the reasonable suspicion of bias test in England, when the real likelihood of bias is dependent of the opinion of right minded persons of the society, meaning thereby to ascertain whether real likelihood of bias is there or not, the courts are to appreciate, the court are to see, the court are, courts are to rely, the courts are to insist on the reasonable suspicion or the opinion as to the existence of bias of the right minded persons of the society. Now, we will discuss all these kinds of bias one by one. The personal bias may arise out of varied circumstances. As I told you that the personal bias arises when the adjudicator has any personal relation, adjudicator has any personal connection either with the parties of the case or the subject matter of the case. In this regard, we can understand that the adjudicator may decide for or against any party to the dispute. If the adjudicator decides for or against any party to the case without giving due considerations to the materials before it, it refers to the bias. The adjudicator may be the friend, the adjudicator may be the relation to a party to the case and because of this friendly or friendly relationship or any other close relationship of the adjudicator with the party with a party to the case, it may decide either for or against any party. There may be the business relationship of the adjudicator with any party to the case. There may be the professional relationship of the adjudicator with any party to the case. The element of personal dislike may be there in the mind of adjudicator. The element of enmity may be there in the mind of adjudicator. The element of hostility, the element of aggression against any particular person, against any particular party to the case may be there, which may give rise to the personal bias. The adjudicator may have been connected or involved in the previous steps of the case in one or the other capacity. That may also be the situation where the personal bias may arise. There are some examples wherein we can understand 
how the personal bias arises and how the courts apply the test of reasonable suspicion of bias to the cases of personal bias. For example, Minglas T. State versus Workmen, which was decided in 1963 by the Supreme Court of India. There was an allegation against some workmen that they have assaulted the manager of the factory. The allegation was against the workmen that those workmen assaulted the manager of the factory. And the same manager of the factory conducts the inquiry. Certainly, there is the possibility of bias, there is the reasonable apprehension of bias, there is a reasonable suspicion of bias in the minds of reasonable persons of the society if the same person who has been assaulted by the workmen is making the inquiry against them. The Mineral Development Corporation versus State of Bihar is very significant example of the personal bias. In Mineral Development Corporation versus State of Bihar, a license was awarded, license was given to the Mineral Development Corporation for coal mining. License for the coal mining was given to Mineral Development Corporation for 99 years. After some years, the Secretary of Revenue issued a notice to the owner of Mineral Development Corporation. This so called notice was issued for the violation of Section 10, Section 12, and Section 14 of the Coal Mine Act. The owner of the Mineral Development Corporation replied to this notice and denied all the allegations which were made by that notice. After two years of this reply by the owner of Mineral Development Corporation, the license was cancelled by the Department of Revenue. There are some more important or significant facts which may help you to understand how the personal bias existed in this case and why the court applied the reasonable suspicion of bias test to cast the decision of the Department of Revenue. The owner of the Mineral Development Corporation, Raja Kamakhya Narayan Singh, he contestants in the earlier general elections against the person who is now the Minister of Revenue. So, against the present Minister of Revenue, Raja Kamakhya Narayan Singh fought the election. He was the candidate in the general election against the then minister. And various criminal complaints were filed by the minister against Raja Kamakhya Narayan Singh. The situation was that, that the High Court of Bihar had to transfer the case to the High Court of Delhi because of the element of political rivalry between Raja Kamakhya Narayan Singh, the owner of Mineral Development Corporation and the Minister of Revenue. After going through these facts, the court decided that there was the personal bias and the decision of the department was affected by the personal bias. The decision of the department was quashed by the Supreme Court in this case. Managlal versus Premchand. Managlal versus Premchand was decided in 1957 by the Supreme Court of India. In Managlal versus Premchand case, a complaint was filed against the Managlal, who was the advocate at High Court of Rajasthan. So, the complaint of professional misconduct was filed against Managlal by Mr. Premchand. After this complaint, the High Court appointed a War Council Tribunal. This War Council Tribunal had three members, including the chairman of the tribunal, the chairman and two members. There was the fact which was raised by the 
party that the chairman of the tribunal earlier represented for premchand in a case when he was the advocate at rajasthan high court when this decision of the constitution of bar council tribunal was challenged on the basis of the personal bias or rule against bias that chairman was not qualified to decide the matter because he had earlier represented for premchand in a case the supreme court of india in this case discussed the rule against bias in very detail though the court did not find any element of bias on the part of likelihood of bias on the part of the tribunal of bar council bar council chairman of bar council tribunal but in final deliberations the supreme court of india quashed the decision and declared the chairman of bar council tribunal as disqualified person to decide the case though the supreme court itself the judges of the supreme court themselves was of the opinion that such a connection between the premchand and the chairman of bar council tribunal was not sufficient to suppose any bias on the part of the chairman bar council tribunal but for the sake of the principle that justice should not only be done but it should also be seen to be done undoubtedly and manifestly it should be seen to be done the chairman bar council tribunal was declared to be disqualified by the court in final deliberations there is a case ak krapak versus union of india this is also the most significant case in the area of personal bias rule against bias and it is also relevant case for the purpose of the constitutional law because first time in india the writ of shashurari was issued against any such body which was purely administrative body and it was not exercising any adjudicatory or quasi judicial functions in ak krapak versus union of india the candidate who was the candidate for the interview for all india cadre of forest services he was acting chief conservator of forest and he was also the candidate for all india cadre of forest services there was a selection committee to select the candidates for all india cadre of forest services and he was also the member of that selection committee so at the same time he was the member of selection committee as well he was the candidate to be selected through that selection committee this selection was challenged on the basis of rule against bias that a person who is the candidate for the selection before the selection committee cannot be the member of selection committee and if he is the member of selection committee there is always the reasonable suspicion of bias the reasonable apprehension of bias in the minds of reasonable persons of the society when this decision was challenged or the selection was challenged the supreme court quashed the selection committee decision of selection committee and issued the writ of shashurari though within the facts of the case it was also the important fact that that candidate did not participate in any final deliberations of the selection committee when he was to present before the selection committee he left the selection committee and he never participated the deliberations by the selection committee to finalize the candidates even then the supreme court of india in this case read issued the writ of shashurari and by applying the rule of or the test of reasonable suspicion of bias there is a case sp kapoor versus state of haryana this sp kapoor versus state of haryana was decided in 1981 by the supreme court in sp kapoor versus state of haryana 
a departmental promotion committee made some selections and prepared the selection list of selected candidates. The departmental selection committee had considered confidential report of the candidates and made the selection on the basis of that departmental confidential report. The selections were made by the selection committee on the basis of the confidential reports of the candidates. Those confidential reports of the candidates were prepared by an officer who was also the candidate for the selection. So, basis of the selection of the candidates by the departmental promotion committee was the confidential report and that confidential report was prepared by an officer of the department. That officer of the department was also the candidate for the selection before the same departmental selection committee and on the basis of this fact, the Supreme Court quashed the decision of departmental selection committee by applying the rule of or the test of reasonable suspicion of bias. In the cases of personal bias, in the cases of pecuniary bias, the Indian courts always apply the test of reasonable suspicion of bias. The second category of bias is the pecuniary bias and this pecuniary bias arises out of any monetary interest of an adjudicator in any party to or subject matter of the case. If the adjudicator has any financial interest, any monetary interest, any economic interest in any party to the case or in the subject matter case, the pecuniary bias arises. This is the principle in the area of administrative adjudication under the rule against bias. Particularly in the cases of personal and pecuniary bias, that if any direct financial interest of the decision maker exists, if it is established, it is proved that any financial interest of the decision maker is there or it exists, then howsoever small it is, it does not matter. The amount and volume of that interest does not matter and the adjudicator may be held disqualified only because of the least economic or very small financial or economic interest in any party to the case or the subject matter of the case. Then the question arises that what matters if the amount or volume of the financial interest does not matter? The answer is that the existence of any direct financial interest matters in the cases of pecuniary bias. Howsoever small it is, it does not matter. Even for very small and an insignificant direct economic interest, the adjudicator, the person making the administrative adjudication may be disqualified from being the decision maker, from being the adjudicator. We can understand the application of this principle in the cases of pecuniary bias by referring an English case, Dimes versus Grand Junction Canal, which was decided in 1852 by the superior most court of England, the House of Lords. In Dimes case, a public limited company brought an action against an owner of a land. In this action which was brought by the public limited company, there was a large interest of the company. A large interest of the company was involved in the case. Lord Chancellor was a shareholder in the company. The Lord Chancellor who was the shareholder in the company, he heard the case and gave the relief to the company as sought by it. The decision of Lord Chancellor was challenged on the basis of the pecuniary bias, on the basis of the rule against bias and it was contended that because the Lord Chancellor 
was the shareholder in the company, he had the pecuniary, economic or financial interest in the case and therefore, he cannot be disqualified person to decide the case. By observing the statement of Lord Campbell, we can understand that what kind of taste or what kind of principle was applied by the House of Lords in this case of pecuniary bias. Lord Campbell opined that while nobody could believe that Lord Chancellor was even remotely influenced by his a small interest in the company, but it is important that the principle that no one should be the judge in his own case be held sacrosanct. Lord Campbell was of the firm opinion that nobody could suppose that Lord Chancellor could be influenced by such a small financial interest in the company, such a remote financial interest in the company in making the decision. But for the sake of the principle that nobody should be the judge in his own case, the decision of the Lord Chancellor was quashed, meaning thereby that the House of Lords applied the taste of reasonable suspicion of bias, not real likelihood of bias. Only on the basis of the reasonable suspicion of bias in the minds of reasonable persons of the society, the decision of Lord Chancellor was quashed by the House of Lords. The similar approach is followed by the Indian courts in determining the cases of pecuniary bias. We can refer to Annamalai versus State of Madras in 1957. In Annamalai case, the Regional Transport Authority granted a permit to one of its members. The High Court cancelled the permit when the permit was granted by the authority to one of its members. GGY versus Assistant Collector decided 1965 by the Supreme Court of India. The Chief Justice Gajendra Galkar was the member of the cooperative society and the land which was in dispute, which was in question in that case and which constituted the subject matter of the case was acquired for the same society to which Justice Gajendra Galkar was the member. He was also the member of the bench constituted to hear the case and when he knew the fact that he was also the member of the cooperative society in favor of which the land was transferred and therefore, he reconstituted the bench. The next case which we can refer J. Mahapatra and Company versus State of Orissa decided in 1984 by the Supreme Court. In this case, the author of a book submitted to be considered for selection himself was the member of the textbook selection committee and therefore, the decision of the committee was quashed by the Supreme Court of India. In the case of Ratanlal Sharma versus managing committee, it was held by the court that if a person has a pecuniary interest, such interest even if very small disqualifies the person from being the decision maker. So, the same approach is being applied in India in the cases of pecuniary bias. We have seen that in the cases of personal bias and in the cases of pecuniary bias, the rule or the taste of reasonable suspicion of bias is applicable in India. Now, the subject matter bias and the subject matter bias may be categorized into four subcategories. The partiality or connection with the issues, number two, the departmental bias or the official bias, number three, the prior utterances or predetermination of the issues and number four, acting under dictation. Partiality or connection with the issue, this category of bias arises where the adjudicator or the decision maker is directly connected to or involved in the subject matter of the case. In the cases of partiality or connection with the issue, mere connection or involvement may not vitiate the proceedings. 
unless the direct and close connection exist. This is the test, this is the principle which is applicable to the cases of subject matter bias. Either these are the cases of partiality or connection with the issue, or these are the cases of official bias or departmental bias, or these are the cases of acting under dictation, or these are the cases of the prior utterances or predetermination of issues. So, in India, there is the divide of in relation to the application of these two tests. In the cases of pecuniary bias and personal bias, the rule of the test of reasonable suspicion of bias is applicable, whereas in the cases of subject matter bias, the test of real likelihood of bias is applicable. We can understand the application of the test of real likelihood of bias in the cases of subject matter bias by referring some cases relating to the partiality or connection with the issue. R versus Deal, this is an English case which was decided in 1881. In R versus Deal case, the magistrate was subscriber to Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The magistrate who was deciding the case was the member of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. But there was the fact that the magistrate had no control over the prosecution by that Royal Society. The society brought an action against a person, filed a suit against the person for the cruelty to a horse. Then it was challenged that the magistrate was not qualified person because he was the subscriber to the Royal Society. But the court did not declare the magistrate as disqualified person because of the fact that the magistrate had no con control over the prosecution by the Royal Society, he was merely a subscriber. The basis of such decision was that there should be very direct and close connection with the subject matter and the decision maker to hold him as disqualified person on the basis of partiality or connection with the issue. We can also refer to the case of Murli Dhar versus Kadam Singh decided in 1954 by Madhya Bharat High Court. In this case, the wife of the chairman of an election tribunal was the member of Congress party and the petitioner defeated the candidate of Congress party in general elections because of this connection of the chairman of election tribunal. It was contended that the chairman of election tribunal was not qualified person because he was the husband of the member of Congress party and the petitioner defeated the candidate of Congress party in general elections. But the court refused the contention and refused to declare the chairman as disqualified person to decide the dispute by holding that to disqualify the person there should be close and direct connection between the adjudicating authority and the issue in controversy. This may happen when the adjudicator acts in several capacities like judge and the witness, judge and the prosecutor or judge and the complainant. We can understand this situation by referring the case of state of UP versus NU. In the case of state of UP versus NU, an inquiry officer in a departmental inquiry left the inquiry and gave the evidence against the person against whom he was conducting the inquiry. So, the inquiry officer left the inquiry and stepped in to the witness box, gave the evidence against the same person against whom he was conducting the inquiry. Then the inquiry officer resumed the inquiry and made the final decision. The court declared him as disqualified person and quashed the decision. 
one more illustration may be taken to understand the application of real likelihood of bias test on the basis of the close and real connection of the adjudicator with the subject matter of the case. By referring the case of Andhra Scientific Company versus Shesh Giri Rao. In Andhra Scientific Company versus Shesh Giri Rao, the inquiry officer was an inquiry was commenced by the general manager of a factory against some workmen. After the examination of five witnesses, the managing director took over the inquiry and he examined the general manager as witness. See, the general manager of the factory initiated the inquiry, he examined five witnesses. After the examination of five witnesses, he left the inquiry, managing director took over the inquiry and then the managing director examined general manager as the witness. The proceedings were quashed on two grounds. Number one, the person who was, who was initially or at initial stage presiding officer of the inquiry proceedings is stepping into the witness box at later stage. So, his functioning, his working in both the capacities as the adjudicator and as the witness. And number two, the managing director who later took over the inquiry and examined the general manager was from very beginning in charge of the prosecution and was active in securing the proper evidence to establish the charges against the workman. So, because of this reason, this close and real connection between the adjudicator and the subject matter of the case, the decision was quashed by the court. The second category of subject bias, subject matter bias is the departmental or official bias. This departmental or official bias arises when an administrator acts as an adjudicatory authority in a dispute between the administration and an individual. So, the departmental inquiry, departmental bias or official bias arises out of the situation where the administrator himself conducts the inquiry. We can refer to the cases like Gullapalli Nageswar Rao versus Andhra Pradesh State Road Transport Corporation, Gullapalli Nageswar Rao first, which was decided in 1959, and then again the Gullapalli Nageswar Rao second, which was also decided in the same year. In Gullapalli Nageswar Rao first case, the secretary of the department was the hearing officer. Some scheme of the nationalization of bus, certain bus routes in the state of Andhra Pradesh was prepared and the secretary was appointed as the inquiry officer against these schemes. The Supreme Court of India quashed the decision of the secretary on the basis that secretary is the part and parcel of the department and he cannot take the objective decisions because he is connected or he is attached with the policies or schemes being prepared by the department from very beginning. So, because of the position of the secretary as the permanent limb of the department and the attachment to the policies or scheme being, being prepared by the department, he was declared to be disqualified person. Then the minister in the second case, the minister was appointed the hearing officer. And the decision of the minister was upheld by the Supreme Court on the ground of the distinction in the position of minister and the secretary to the department. Minister is acting only in supervising capacity, he is not the permanent limb and therefore the decision of the minister was upheld by the Supreme Court. Then the Kundala Rao versus Andhra Pradesh State Road Transportation, the position was clarified by the Supreme Court. In this case, the Supreme Court says the same facts were there. There was the scheme of nationalization of certain bus routes, but it was clarified by the Supreme Court of India in Kundala Rao case that 
only on the presumption of bias or only for the reason that the minister or the secretary or the official of the department is the permanent limb of the department, the decision cannot be quashed or the decision cannot is not liable to be challenged. Because any such official of the department or the minister of the department, he is working, he is functioning in his official capacity and if he is functioning in judicial manner, he is deciding the case by considering the objections properly and by giving the opportunity to the objectors. If he is acting in judicial manner, then his decision cannot be liable to be challenged on the ground that he is the permanent limb of the department. Only for the only on the basis of presumption of bias, the decision cannot be challenged. What is needed to challenge the decision that there must be some substantial material to prove the bias on the part of the decision maker. If there is any such substantial material to prove the bias on the part of the decision maker, he can be declared to be disqualified person. Otherwise, only on the presumption of bias, only for the reason that he is the permanent limb of the department, his decision will not be, uh, he will not be declared to be disqualified or his decision cannot be quashed. The same approach was applied in the Mudalier case by the Supreme Court of India. Without referring Gullapalli Nageswar Rao and by applying the approach of the court as held by the Supreme Court of India in Kundala Rao case, the Supreme Court of India did not quash the decision when the allegation was made that they, the, the, there was the connection between the official and official deciding the matter and the subject matter. The law which was established by or laid down by the Supreme Court of India in Kundala Rao and Mudalier case was followed in the case of Institute of Chartered Accountants of India versus L. K. Ratna, Amarna Chaudhary versus Vaitweight and Company Limited, Naranchan Naskar versus Arun Bhattacharya and we can understand that in the cases of official bias or departmental bias, the, the test of real likelihood of bias was applied, not the reasonable suspicion of bias. In relation to the prior utterances and predetermination of issues, the Supreme Court has been of the opinion that only on the basis of the prior statements by the officials or the ministers as to the policies which are to be adopted or followed or followed or the policies which are to be followed by the department in future, he cannot be declared to be disqualified person unless there is the irrevocable and irreversible decision on the part of the adjudicator first. So, the correct position of law in this regard has been pointed out by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Kundala Rao that unless the policy statement shows a final and irrevocable decision and foreclosing of mind of the hearing officer, he cannot be held to be disqualified person. Likewise, when any adjudicator is acting under the dictation of the superior authority, then it is to be seen whether he is acting with his open mind or there is element of the foreclosing of mind on the part of the adjudicator, on the part of the decision maker. So, if the decision maker is acting with his foreclosed mind, only then he is declared to be disqualified person. On the basis of this discussion, we can understand that in the cases of personal bias and pecuniary bias, the taste of reasonable suspicion of bias is applicable, whereas in the cases of departmental bias, official bias, subject matter bias, partiality or connection with the issue or the situation when the adjudicator is acting under dictation, the real likelihood of bias test is applicable, not the reasonable suspicion of bias test. So, this is all about the rule against bias, the personal bias, pecuniary bias, 
the certain kinds of bias be discussed and the taste or the principles to be applicable in the cases of bias be also discussed. In the next session, in the next lecture, we will discuss on the rule of hearing the audi ultimum partum. Thank you.